Hello, Endeavor here. So today I'm speaking with a rather interesting guest who I think is really kind of an unsung hero of the right wing and of uh, kind of the uh, dissident right and uh, in our sphere of politics. I'm speaking with Sean Last. How are you doing tonight, Sean? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing not too badly. Uh, and the reason I wanted to have you on is that what's been big in the news lately was this whole uh, Ahmad Arbery uh, controversy and the the narratives that are surrounding it. Um, but I, I guess before we get into that, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, what exactly do you do? Oh, I have a YouTube channel, Sean Last, and I'm on Twitter. And I make a lot of content around, uh, I guess the, the focus would be trying to explain differences between races in ways that don't blame those differences on white people. That's probably the primary focus. Yeah, and uh, you worked uh, extensively with Ryan Falk of the Alternative Hypothesis. It was you two that run, ran the blog back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we've been friends for a long time, and we created the website Alternative Hypothesis together. And for a while, we ran the YouTube channel together. Uh, so yeah, yeah that, that is true. Yeah, it's very it's very uh, date, and I find your your channel is very da uh, data oriented. So it's it really goes into the details of. Uh, of statistics and uh, various papers and and stuff like that. So uh, you know, I think a lot of our talking points, which uh, um, we now, which are now really commonplace on the right wing, I think a lot of those probably uh, owe a lot to um, <laughs> to the, uh, the to the data mining that you and Ryan have done for you know for years now. So um, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, first was the Ahmad Arbery situation. And for anyone who doesn't know, I, I guess I'll give like a short summary of what happened exactly. So there's a guy in Georgia, his name was Ahmad Arbery. He's a uh, African American and he had a criminal background record. Uh, there was a call to uh, 911 reporting someone matching his description, trespassing in a neighborhood in Georgia when a man named George McMichael, uh, uh, sorry, Gregory McMichael, uh, who was a, um, a retired cop and investigator for the Georgia district attorney uh, or the district attorney's office in their area, and his son, Travis McMichael, uh, were had heard of the suspicious activity and um, attempted to, to put Arbery under a citizen's arrest. And Arbery was not a known criminal to Gregory McMichael, who had worked uh, who had worked on the prosecution for him for one of his charges um so what happened was arbery was uh so was spotted uh running uh from uh, was ru spotted running and he ran past the truck where the mcmichaels were uh par had were parked um travis mcmichael got out of the truck holding a shotgun which is le uh, he was legally carrying in the state of georgia and they said they said that they, they just wanted they tried to stop him to talk to him but arbery uh charged at mcmichaels grabbed the gun and attempted to wrestle it away from him and then mcmichael shot him and uh, which would kill arbery uh the the police department and district attorneys both agreed that the mcmichaels had act had acted legally they were legally performing a citizen's arrest arrest they were legally carrying the firearm and uh, Travis McMichael had acted in self-defense and no charges were filed until a video was leaked of the incident happening and it got it was caught hold of by celebrities by the media by leftist activists and these civil rights groups and uh, they created all this outrage on social media LeBron James tweeted about it uh, Joe Biden tweeted about it and then it basically ca caused a storm and now Travis and Gregory uh, McMichael are charged with murder so, I mean, what, what's your take on, on this case, Sean? I mean, in some ways, it's a kind of incredible case because unlike in past incidences with, uh, you know, Mike Brown or Trayvon Martin or whatever, we actually have a video of what happened. And somehow the narrative is still uh, proliferating that something completely contrary to what happened actually happened, which I think is, is somewhat extraordinary. Uh, you know, with like the Mike Brown thing. What actually happened is somewhat similar in that what happened is someone tried to arrest Mike Brown. It was a cop, but uh, Mike Brown tried to steal his gun, and that's why he got shot. And so the left did the sensible thing. They just sort of made up the story about, no, actually, he was running away. He had hands up, don't shoot. And then he was shot. Uh, 
he obviously was not actually trying to take the gun from the person arresting him. But in this case, there's actually video. I, I mean, the way the video was described when I first heard about it, it sounded as if they they like had a video of an Emmett Till incident or something like this. The, the, the guy was just like jogging down the road in a completely innocuous way. And, and some crazy white racist pickup truck came by just taking pot shots at the guy. It's like randomly opening fire or something like this. So it's a very sad thing, I guess, that somehow, even though we know exactly what happened, and even though the citizen arrest laws and things like this are not very complicated to understand, somehow this is still a story about how lynching still happens in 2020 in America or something like this. Yeah, and I actually wrote down a list of different lies that are being told about the situation, which, I mean, we we, we can verify both from facts that we know and from the video itself. One is that Arbery was this model citizen who only ever wanted to be an electrician. Like they put his high school photo in the newspaper when they actually had a mugshot of him for much more recently of one of his arrests. Uh, another lie is that he was just out for a jog. We have video evidence of him rummaging through uh, the, ho the home under construction, which under the law, it's considered burglary if you break into a place with intention to steal something, even if you don't end up actually stealing something. So it's still, uh, he's still committing a felony really. And um, we, it's theorized that he was trying to steal construction equipment. So he is uh, in the process of committing a, a crime very likely. Uh, and well, the, the McMichaels were definitely under the impression that he did. Um, another lie is that they hunted him down. We literally have video of them in the truck while he runs toward them. Uh, the other one is that they, they hunted him down and shot him because he was black and that they had no good reason to fire on him and that uh, they were motivated by this deep hatred and uh, for black people, not a genuine concern over his own activity and then in self-defense. And lastly, that the McMichaels weren't charged because they were white and that Arbery was black. I mean, are there any other are there any other things I'm missing about like just uh, falsehoods being told by uh, the media right now? I mean, probably. I mean, the falsehoods are almost endless. I mean, there's all, there's this very silly confusion where people keep saying, well, even if he had uh, trespassed, even if he had committed burglary, uh, it, it is still not justified to shoot him for that. They're pretending that pretending that he was shot for the burglary when, in fact. Obviously, what happened is he was uh, people tried to stop him from leaving because of the burglary. He was shot for trying to steal the guy's gun, presumably to shoot him. That's a very silly lie that keeps being spread about. And a lot of the things you already named, I mean, they show the the deep dishonest nature. I, I mean, think about what you said, and this isn't just in this case. They always come out with, oh, look at the picture of whenever the last time they looked like an innocent person was and, and talk about how they have these aspirations to be these great people. But then also if you start talking about their criminal record, they say, well, how dare you bring up this man's life prior to the crime? That has nothing to do with anything. You're a very racist, horrible person for even talking about it. Now look at this picture of how innocent they looked 10 years ago or whatever, which is, uh, I mean, it reveals that they don't believe even what they say. And there's an obvious logical relevance too. If you're accusing someone of, uh, you know, breaking into a place and, and stealing, it's relevant that they've been arrested for shoplifting before, for instance. Yeah. It's obviously relevant, but somehow they pretend to not understand that logic, uh, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and another thing that they uh, that I read was that he was at, he had actually been put on probation before for, um, for, car for carrying a gun to a high school basketball game. And he was arrested for that and put on, I think it was five years probation. I don't know if at the time of uh, his death, he was still on probation. But um, since he was known to uh, McMichaels, uh, if, since he was known to, Mc, to Gregory McMichael, who had worked on one of the prosecutions against him, um, it's, very, it's, very, it's very understandable that McMichaels could have, who, who knew that it was Ar Arbery, it's very uh, understandable that he could have had a reasonable suspicion that Arbery could have been armed. And uh, the, what you see really is that the, the engagement was not uh, started by Travis. It was started by, uh, by Ahmaud Arbery, who you can very clearly in the video see uh, lurch, lurching to grab away the shotgun. I mean, when the altercation starts at the, at the very beginning of the altercation, they're behind a truck, so it's a little hard to see, but then just a minute later, uh, Travis McMichael is pushed back a few feet, and you can very clearly see the two wrestling over the gun. So um, 
I mean, I guess there's what's so incredible about this case is that there's video evidence showing exactly what happened, which seems to very much, in, in my opinion, verify a lot of the things that the McMichaels had said uh, upon their, upon their uh, initial questioning. But I mean, it just seems that the media has this power to create narratives that are just out of complete falsehoods and that that's what that's what the the um society is going to go with that well th at least that's what uh that's the direction that uh the, the police are gonna are gonna follow so now that there's media outrage around it now the the police and the district attorney have changed their opinion on uh on the case yeah and and sadly even I don't know the exact proportion, but I would guess something like two thirds, maybe more of the conservative media is also taking the obviously incorrect stance on this. And for some reason, pretending that, that, that it makes sense to try these people for murder because they saw someone committing a crime, then running away, told them to stop. And then the guy attacked them and tried to steal their gun. So they shot him, which is, uh, which is and it's not even clear that he didn't steal anything. I should say as well, because in the video of the, uh, the incident, we don't know where it came from, but there is, in fact, a hammer on the ground right behind where Aubrey is at the beginning of the video in the middle of the street. It's not we don't know that he was holding that hammer, that he took it from the construction site or that he dropped it. But it's not an implausible inference that that very well could be the case. Uh, and, and, any, I mean, and it's true. You can't see the first sort of moment of physical contact between them because they're in front of the truck. But you can see the old uh, the guy with the gun just standing there, and then Aubrey turning ninety degrees and charging right at him into the front of the truck. So it's it's not ambiguous <laughs> who started this fight at all. <laughs> and and it's about, I mean, listen, if you didn't see it, you would think that they had a video of a lynching or something like this. It's uh, I, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like uh, for example, LeBron James tweeted out that. Like every time black people walk out of their house, they're hunted down. They can't even go for a jog without being murdered. And Joe Biden tweeted that uh, Arbery was murdered in cold blood as if these guys basically were just like, you know, guys in these like KKK robes, just hunt, uh, searching for a black person to murder or something like that. Um, what are some other examples? Uh, this this one tweet, which got uh, which got a lot of traction, like over a hundred thousand likes or something, said, "How are you going to teach your children, your uh, white children, not to kill my children?" And I mean, like, it's just complete, uh, it's just complete fantasy land that these people are living in. I mean, uh, I wrote down several lies that are really not only related to this case, but really related to the entire. Uh, narrative around uh, blacks and criminal justice in the United States. And, and here's a few that I thought of, that white people in the America have this hateful and unfounded prejudice towards black, that black, black people, that they act on this supposed hatred, that black people are routinely hunted down and killed by white people for no reason other than being black, that white people are a threat to black communities and uh, the people in them that law enforcement un uh, unfairly discriminates against blacks blacks in terms of force arrests prosecutions and jail sentences and that it unfairly discriminates in favor of whites in re in regards to these same actions and you, you know i think what's really so useful about a lot of uh, a lot of the videos that you've made is that um a lot of them they show that not only are these narratives not true in many cases it's actually the exact opposite that's true I mean, it's certainly exactly the exact opposite that uh, uh, of the truth that white people routinely hunt down black people and kill them. I mean, if 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 anyone is hunting anyone down, I mean, it would be the other. It would be black people hunting down whites. Oh yeah, I mean, obviously, the number of white on black murders that occur each year is much smaller than the number of black on white murders. Uh, and as as conservatives like to point out, I mean, the the real big player here is black on black murders, but people don't like the. Percent that don't exist. I mean, all those things are just, I mean, they're well studied and, and just known to not be true. I mean, you talked about the, the general idea that white people are biased uh, against black people. There are easy, it's easy to experimentally test whether or not people are racist. And the results of these experiments overwhelmingly show white Americans on average, you know, you can talk about maybe they have some uh, mental hang up, but they don't act on it if they do. Uh, their behavior is completely non biased racially. By contrast, our African American friends uh, routinely score. In, in such a way as to imply that they act in a very racially biased way. And this is even true, it, it, relevant to the criminal justice thing, in experiments on jurors. Right? So the, the people 
like to pretend that it's somehow white people that are going to be racially biased on a jury in an interracial crime. And the empirical evidence just shows that the exact opposite is the case. And this sort of thing has been going on, I mean, I mean just forever. This weird obsession with the crimes that uh, white people commit against black people as if whenever this happens, this is some indictment. I mean, I mean in this case, it, as in many of the cases of Black Lives Matter, it's not even a legitimate crime. But even if it were, right, I mean, firstly, there'd be no evidence that race had anything to do with it at all. This is just something that people are are, are literally just making up. There's no evidence at all that there was a racial motive behind anything that happened. And then even if there was a racial motive behind it happening, this would be a very rare thing. And it would play into this pattern uh, by which people you just concentrate on these sorts of incidences and they never look at the opposite ones. I mean, people have been tweeting and it's sad that they can do this, but it's just on any given you know, couple of days, you can find some incident of a black person committing a horrible crime against white people that isn't going to be in the news. I mean, there's this thing circulating on Twitter recently uh, about this black guy who got a gun and went to a graveyard and just started, he killed two people that were white people that were there viewing uh, their dead child at the graveyard. I mean, that's not going to be a national story. Uh, because that doesn't serve the interests of the people who decide what national, what stories become national stories. And this goes back forever. I mean, you look at, and and to be clear here, when I say this, I'm not suggesting in any way that uh, there have never been horrible crimes committed against uh, black people or that lynchings were somehow okay or something like that. But it is worth noting that the the number of lynchings that are estimated to have occurred against black people in the United States in all of its history, I think it's something like 3000. Now that's bad, right? Killing 3000 people is bad, but it only takes a couple years for us to stack up that many black and white murders in the United States. Just on, just you know, given the regular criminal activity of people uh, in, in this country, so it's a long-standing thing. It's really embedded in our history very deeply that we obsess over uh, the crime when it goes one way and not the other way. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the examples is that in the Trayvon Martin case, uh, George Zimmerman was not a white man; he was a mestizo. His, his mother was Peruvian. And, you know, if, if you didn't know any better, you could think that him in court was going to be some like video on Vox of some, you know, guy whose parents brought him here in the 80s being, you know, deported for being an illegal immigrant or something like that. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But then, uh, you know, the, the Trayvon Martin case, that was a, a very early red pill for me because it was just those lies upon lies with that one. And one of the, the biggest ones was that George Zimmerman's not even white. I mean, he wouldn't he wouldn't be considered white on and in any other circumstances, other than uh, the if, other than the circumstances in which uh, his um, his killing of Trayvon Martin, which very arguably was in self defense, uh, can be used to push the anti white narrative. I mean, uh, that this one is that one was really perplexing. That uh, George Zimmerman, how could he possibly be considered a white man? <laughs> well, and, and the answer to that was, you know, oh, well, he can't possibly be considered a white man if people see him. So let's just be unimaginably dishonest. I mean, right, very famously what they did, uh, CNN, they doctored his skin color in images. They made him artificially look whiter than he was. They <laughs> altered the phone call to make it look like he was randomly blurting out that Trayvon Martin was black when, in fact, uh, he was asked by the police for the race and stuff like this. I mean, they – that was – I think that case – sort of began a red pilling process for a lot of people because it was just so obviously and deeply dishonest what they were doing. And you have to ask, I mean, not only is it bad that they're dishonest, but for any person that, that, that thinks that gets them asking the question, why is the media trying to lie to me to, to make me think that there's some epidemic and, and black people don't even believe this, that there's some epidemic of uh, white people killing black people. I mean, whoever it was, LeBron James or whatever says, oh, whenever we go to our house, we're going to get shot. I mean, what would you actually act like if you really believed that? I mean, I know what I would do. One thing, I wouldn't go outside. Right? Like, very odd, like, I literally thought I was being hunted down. I wouldn't be jogging down, you know, in the neighborhood in the middle of the day or whatever in a, in a white suburb or wherever it was. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that I think that just people know, uh, even if they don't want to, either don't want to admit it, or you know, they they have to rely on some kind of cognitive cognitive, cognitive dissidence that what they're saying is not true because. Everyone knows, be it a conser- white conservative, white liberal, black person, that the black neighborhood is more dangerous <laughs> than the white neighborhood. The bla- a black person is much more likely to get murdered by another black person in the black neighborhood than uh, going through some, uh, you know, uh, white suburb in I don't know Connecticut or something like that. It's, I mean, it's just absolutely insane. 
Um, but yet these are, these are lies that are just uh, continuously perpetuated by the media. And, you know, um, what it speaks to is really a belief that I have that, you know, there's, I'm just convinced that there's an, an anti-white agenda. I mean, I, I mean, what would your, uh, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that these lies are really just the result of lack of information or there's just clearly an anti-white agenda going on? Oh, I know. I mean, clearly there's an anti-white agenda. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean they, uh, I mean, people have been socialized and it's kind of sad in a way that this can happen, that people can learn how to respond to certain situations. Because what you might want to say is that uh, people, especially liberals, but also our society in general, has an ingrained kind of hatred of white people. And that sounds kind of weird because a lot of those people are white or, or something close to it. And so, but people can be socialized to respond as if they hate something, even if they've never sat down and really thought through it and decided that they actually hate a group. But the media, I mean, firstly, the media having an anti-white bias, I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, the, the New York Times publishes material literally talking about how uh, minority children should not befriend white children because white children are duplicitous people who cannot be trusted. Or whatever. And, and they talk about, I, mean, I remember there was an advice column. I think this was also in the New York Times like a year or two ago where someone wrote in and, and said they were trying to be this great white ally to minorities, but they still felt guilty. They couldn't escape this white guilt. This person was clearly mentally ill. They were in the fetal position, they said, crying about how bad they felt. And this advice column, I mean, they went back and forth and they ultimately decided, look, at the end of the day, your suffering's not what matters. <laughs> you need to be helping the, and there's empirical evidence on this as well. I mean, uh, not about journalists specifically, but about, I, I guess, liberals in general anyway in the United States. Like, for instance, there's this classic, uh, you know, these sort of utilitarian trolley problems where you, will you sacrifice, will you murder someone uh, in order to save a greater number of people? And a funny thing about liberals is they're more willing to do that if the person they're sacrificing is white rather than black. So yeah. Literally, they, they value the lives of, of white people uh, less, and then the, the evidence bears that out. Yeah, and another thing that I, I've also noticed with a lot of the statistics that that I've seen come out is that um, this narrative of kind of the evil, angry white guy who you know is just like a, a irredeemable racist who just hates everyone, uh, who hates everyone. There's not like him, you know, like the right the right winger, the Trump supporter, the uh, you know white supremacist, whatever. It's just not even really backed up either because. Some of the really interesting studies I've seen are ones that show that liberals are actually more likely to mistreat people that disagree with them. They're more likely to, to um, disown friends or family members who have different opinions than them. They're more likely to view conservatives as just uh, inherently evil than just simply having a different opinion. Uh, and then you, another hilarious one I saw was that uh, amongst uh, met people who have mental illnesses, uh, uh, the younger someone is and the more liberal they are, or well, sorry, white liberals in particular, it doesn't seem to be the case for minorities, but uh, in, in terms of white liberals, they have the highest rate of mental illness. And, you know, I've made a video about one of my family members before and really about just how he's, how this kind of ideology, he's a leftist, has just turned him into a basket case. I mean, like, do you, what have you noticed about kind of that like entire narrative that like, you know, there's just just deep, this deep hatred inside every uh, white American's heart, and that kind of conservatives and right wingers are just uh, these irredeemable bigots. I mean, it just doesn't seem to line up with the reality either. No, I mean the funny thing is, in a lot of this experimental research on the discriminatory behavior of people by political ideology, it's not symmetrical. It's not that like leftists discriminate against white people, and then conservatives discriminate in favor of white people across a whole bunch of tests. It's actually the conservatives act in a pretty egalitarian way, and liberals uh, do not. And, and that's, I mean, this, uh, you, you can, I mean, in some ways, the, the conservative would, the conservatives would be better if they spent a little more time having, a, you know, somewhat more of a bias, I think, in favor of themselves than they do. It's not even entirely a good thing. And same with this tolerance thing. I mean, it's true, leftists are much, much less tolerant than uh, conservatives are in America today. And conservatives brag about that sometimes. And it's such a weird thing to brag about because you know, in the long run, if one group tolerates the other and the other one doesn't in, in something like a culture war, I mean, that sets you up for failure, almost inevitable failure if you play that game enough times. Oh yeah, uh, I, I would definitely agree that uh, tolerance is, not, is certainly not a virtue in, uh, in that regard that you know, if, somebody, if somebody actively hates you, you should not be tolerant of them in any way, shape, or form, as as far as I'm concerned. 
but even the, the argument that that you know leftists are just these uh, these kind, loving, tolerant people, like it really doesn't line up with the reality either. Um, you know, I th I'd say that one of my first red pills was um, you know, it was with the I mentioned the Trayvon Martin case, but it was really more the the reaction to, to it by people on my Facebook wall. Um, you know, I, I like, for example, having a bunch of guys who uh, I had played rugby with in high school, you know, a bunch of uh, who, they, a bunch of minorities who I considered my friends, uh, basically posting on on Facebook about how they hate white people and how I mean, I'm not American, I'm Canadian, but uh, how America and how white people are horrible and that, you know, they just uh, the society is just designed to oppress, uh, you know, people of color and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it was really. Um, I mean, for me, at least, that, that was a really uh, kind of depressing. Uh, that, that was kind of a, de a depressing revelation uh, for me, at least. And, you know, I, I feel like a lot of these a lot of these lies that um, are really just pushed from the media. Uh, would you say that the the base of them is kind of an an egalitarianism? It's kind of the assumption of interchange interchangeability between differing groups of people. Well, I, I, it's a bit awkward to call it egalitarianism, I think, b because it isn't. It, I mean, I mean it's it selective. really is anti. It's, yeah. it's selective, and it's. Uh, I think the, the right way to think about the left in general isn't so much that they're trying to flatten hierarchies as it is that they're trying to invert them. Right? Because it's not that they say, no, actually, black and white people are the same. I mean, they may say that, but their actions are such that what they're actually doing is suggesting that black people are in some way better than white people. Or that women are better than men, gays are better than, you know, you can do this with a bunch of things. This is the case where they, they kind of adopt, because they see these people, I guess, as historical victims or whatever, but they adopt a kind of supremacism with respect to whatever group, uh, you know, they happen to latch onto that they see at the bottom. Yeah. And, and you know, what, what I've really kind of noticed is, yeah, the, I would agree that it's not really about creating equality. That's really the what they really just say that they want. They say they want equality, but in reality, it is just anti-white. It is designed to uh, subjugate and eventually destroy people of European descent. I'm, I'm convinced that that's what uh, that, that's the purpose of this entire agenda. Um, but it seems like it relies not only on um, because of course there's plenty of factual errors, but it also relies on this kind of like metaphysical concept of what they call racism. Because you know the word racism, as far as I'm, I, I I know, is only around a hundred years old or so, and hasn't it didn't really come into popular use until after World War II. But it seems like what you know through media, through education, uh, what the left has been able to do. And well, you know, the, the people behind the left, uh, there is a certain uh, there is a certain group which has been uh, disproportionately involved in pushing this narrative, but I can't mention them on YouTube, uh, is that um, they've kind of uh, they've kind of created racism as this like metaphysical evil, which what racism really means is anything that's good for white people. So, you know, what, what they'll some examples of this is that if a white person makes more money than a black person, that's evidence of racism. But if an Asian or a uh, Jewish person makes more money than a white person, that's not evidence of racism. If there's more black people than, than white people in the NFL, that's not racism either. If a white man commits a crime, well, that's evidence he's racist. If a black person commits a crime, it's evidence he's the victim of racism. And if the police arrest him, well, then that's racism. Do you notice that how kind of the, the entire concept of racism is something that it, it doesn't really make sense in a, in a factual uh, sense, but it's more just like this metaphysical evil that has really kind of been created in order to advance uh, to advance the anti-white agenda. Yeah, I, I think that's I mean that's true, and, and the notion of racism that the left has created over time is a really weird one because it's put as this moral norm which is directly contradictory of uh, sort of older moral norms that I think most people would think are, are more important in a lot of ways. So, for instance, uh, you talk about something like why do black people have uh, lower incomes than white people? And it turns out that's just because they score lower on various traits that are important towards having a high level of income, IQ being the most prominent one. And then people say, oh, well, and I've had people say this to me, if they're getting paid less, if they're less likely to be employed, if whatever, because they have lower IQ, that's you're just justifying the racism. That's still racist, even if there's a rational reason to do it. And, and the idea seems to be that white people should be compelled to treat 
black people in a way that is contrary to how they actually are because the virtue of being an anti-racist is more important than a virtue like uh, being in accordance with the truth, with uh, being rational and sane and things like this. I mean, this reminds me of just, uh, there's this poll. It's kind of pathetic, but there are these uh, polls of left-wingers in the United States, and they just say, in fact, that they would rather be known as someone who who is a liar than be known as someone who did something that's racist, which I think is a very backward sense of moral intuitions. <laughs> you know, uh, there was this there was this brilliant thread that I can't remember who posted this on on Twitter, but I, I really like this. Was they went over the Ten Commandments and they asked in modern Western society, what is worse, breaking each of the Ten Commandments or racism? And what the conclusion they came to was that for every single commandment, except for maybe the possibility of murder racism is considered worse. So, you know, somebody stealing, uh, like a black person stealing from a store uh, is worse. Sorry, um, racism is worse than him uh, robbing a store if, uh, you know, he gets, he ends up getting shot by a person who's white uh, for, for stealing that from that store, not because of his race, but because he was committing a felony. That's considered, uh, that act of quote unquote racism is considered worse than theft. And, you know, even in some cases, <laughs> it is even questionable questionable if the left actually does consider murder to be worse than racism. You know, uh, I'm currently reading the book, uh, The Gulag Archipelago by um, Alexander uh, Solzhenitsyn. And really what it reminds me of uh, the book is, you know, the, 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 the sections where he's talking about different people who have been arrested by the NKVD and things like that. What it reminds me of is a lot of these ant these anti racism witch hunts today, where really just racism, uh, as my friend the distributist point points out, it just means whatever people in uh, institutions of authority want it to mean at that very moment. So it's a completely malleable definition, uh, which just allows them to move the goalposts in any direction they really want to. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Like you know, the '90s, right? to be not racist was to be colorblind. And now that literally is a kind of racism. So cl clearly it is malleable. And this is a bit of a, a meta point, I suppose, but it's also weird how this ethic of racism, there's no, it's not clear at all why we're supposed to not be racist the way they conceptualize it. There's no real grounding for it. Like there's an idea. I mean, you could say, oh, okay, there's a kind of racism where what we're talking about is when you, uh, uh, judge individuals in ways that are factually unfair. And this is going to lead to all sorts of problems. It'll lead to problems for you personally, for instance, if you don't associate with people because you think things that are untrue about them or you're acting irrationally towards them given what is true about them. Uh, and so if, if that's what we meant by uh, don't be racist, that would make sense. But they have expanded it in this way where there's no, like, it's not clear why racism is even bad given their amorphous, gigantic, broad conception of it. Why it would be bad to not hire someone uh, because, you know, they score poorly on an, a cognitive ability test or something like this, and they're black. There's no clear justification for it. I mean, it's not as if they're saying, I mean, in some ways it'd be better if they said, oh, no, well, we have like the woke God. Mm -hmm. And so we have these commitments, but they don't even, but they don't have that either. So there's no practical justification for it and no theological justification for it. Uh, it's, I don't know, at an intellectual level, it's, it's a very, it's almost an incoherent or entirely baseless morality to begin with. Uh, yeah, because, you know, uh, the point I've really made is that progressivism and, you know, social justice politics are a secular form of religion, um, which have essentially taken, uh, they've, ta they've essentially turned white people into this metaphysical evil and black people into this metaphysical good. Uh, and, you know, there's only one group that's considered big bigger victims than them. And again, we can't mention them, but uh, the, uh, like, for example, if, uh, if somebody commits a crime, it's considered a worse crime if uh, the person is a different race. But you know, of course, that's not really the case. It's only if it, it's only considered a worse crime if that per, if the person that committed it is white and that the victim is is black. But it's considered a lesser crime if the victim is white and the and the perpetrator is non-white. So it, it seems like they have that you know the concept of racism is a way of like uh, of um, like re reorienting morality. Like you know, for uh, for, ex for example. Um, is it wrong to punch someone in the face? Of course, it's wrong to punch someone in the face. But is it? Th does it make it wor worse if you do it be, uh, to somebody who's a different race than you, or does it do it? Does it make it worse if that's the reason you do it? I mean, maybe if it's like the maybe if you do have this like deep hatred inside you, yeah, you could say that. But 
um, it's just really odd to like the, like the entire definition of hate crime. I know in the U S that's not as uh, prevalent as it is in places like the UK right now, but what it essentially is, is legal precedent that says that if a crime is committed to somebody else, to somebody of a different race and that the motive is quote unquote hate, which again, as you know, you've pointed out in your videos, uh, is very hard to prove, then that crime is deemed a, uh, not only a crime, but like this, um, spirit it's like a blasphemous crime it's it, it's commuted as just like uh as a not only a crime but a heresy of some kind yeah and, and as a society obviously what we really put moral weight on is if the motive isn't just you know racism it's specifically white people being racist so i mean not only are these uh, is a commonplace for black and white murder to occur but they're also big historical i mean in the 80s the name of it is not coming to me right now, but there was this big cult of uh, black people where the initiation rite was literally chopping off a body part of a white person and bringing it. And most people, if this was the other way around, this would be like one of the, this would be like an Emmett Till thing. It'd be one of these things that everyone has heard of, one of the great stories of racism in the history of our society. And basically no one has heard of this. And there are a bunch of examples uh, like that, where, where it's clear, I mean, the law has to be consistent to some degree, but as a society, what we actually care about uh, is obviously specifically going one way because we have the, I don't know, we have this weird idea that black people are, are on the brink of, of destruction or something and the white people are going to do it. And so we have to be really vigilant about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they um, actually, the, the other thing, the other thing I, I've noticed though, is that it, it's almost as if, um, it's almost as if institutional power really just supersedes truth in many in many ways. Like what, what you'll see, what you'll see is that um, it doesn't really matter what is true because you know you can have all of these uh, you can you can have all of these um, facts on your side. You can have video evidence for God's sakes, uh, but then you know when the media, the education system, the civil rights groups are all really working together to manufacture a narrative. I mean, it seems like that's that's what always wins out, you know, They and it's really winning out over conservative media, too, because people like John Walsh and uh, and such are really kind of just being strong armed in order to um, just bend the knee really to the narrative. And that uh, <laughs> I mean, what, what it seems right, right, like right now is that you're kind, we're kind of entering into this, uh, you know, post truth society where um, you know, the, the left used that has used that phrase before to describe the right. But um, what it seems what it seems today is that they have the institutional strength to just decide what is true and what isn't. Yeah, and I, I think they have for a for a long time. I mean, I think we've sort of we've been post truth. But what's happening recently is people are noticing, at least on the Internet, that we're post truth because there's a little bit of a more decentralization, more uh tension between different sources of information. And so it's easier to notice that you're just being given lies. And at the end of the day, I mean, this is sort of just how political psychology works, that people really aren't considered of the truth. Uh, truth, And it would be kind of weird if they were, right? Because knowing the truth about some, it's not like knowing the truth about uh, how much gas is in your car. There's a direct practical, practical utility for that in your real life. Whereas knowing the truth about these political things, uh, I mean, you can't do anything about it. For the most part. And so, in fact, it is in a kind of formal way rational for people uh, to look at political views as even subconsciously as things where the primary utility is going to come from uh, social coalitions, from fitting in of the group by saying the right thing. You're not actually benefited by uh, knowing the truth. And so unless you're like a weirdo, basically, there's no even incentive for you to to try to get to something like that. Yeah, I mean, what what you'll notice uh, is that people really kind of don't actually form their beliefs around statistics. They form it around narrative. And that's why narrative is so much more powerful than really just fact sheets. I mean, um, and not not to not to disparage your work, but have you noticed that really even when you show a liberal all these facts in the world, you know, you can show them all these studies that prove their uh, what they're saying is false. Many times they'll just say that, well, the facts are racist or something like that. They'll just write it off and basically just, uh, uh, they'll, they'll just retreat into their kind of narrative. Have you, have you encountered that uh, in your time really connect, collecting all these stats? Oh, for sure. I mean, the especially on the internet. On the internet, people do that. All, I, it's much easier to convince people in person than it is over the internet. But on the internet, people 
will just bury their heads in the sand and pretend they can't hear. One of the things they do, they pretend they can't speak English. They, they pretend they literally don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> I've never had that one for me. I, I mean, they don't, I, I mean, someone hyperbole, they don't say they can't speak English, but they just, they pretend like you're saying something that's obviously not what you're saying. And I make fun of that by saying that they, pretending they can't speak English. But uh, the statistics and stuff, I mean, you have to be in a certain place to be receptive to any kind of argumentation. If someone's in a certain place where they're already uh, questioning things because of something like a Trayvon Martin uh, incident or something like that, uh, then that would be the context in which I would think that, uh, especially over the internet, data can come in handy in making someone think, okay, no, actually one of these viewpoints just literally is true and one is in just made up and entirely untrue. Although in person, this doesn't really, I mean, in my experience anyway, in person, you can sort of force people to change their views because they can't pretend to not know what you're saying. They can't just not respond or something like that. No, they can't just block, they can't just block you. Um, <laughs> but even in person, I've kind of had, I've run into that problem before too. Like for instance, this leftist family member I have, uh, I tried to explain to him once how mass immigration is bad for the working class uh, because their wages go down and their cost of living goes up due to it. I mean, you know, more labor in the economy, obviously wages go down and more uh, demand for housing. Obviously the price of housing goes up. And his response was to just say that um, supply and demand is a pseudoscience and that it doesn't act, that that's not actually a real law. And then he just called me a racist. So <laughs> I mean, it, it, in many times, in many ways, like uh, they, the, the, the kind of like uh, religious understanding that they have of uh, of egalitarianism, it, it will supersede the evidence that they're presented with, um, it, it, in a way that like they can they can write off uh, they can write off just things like that. Like you know one of the perf one of the perfect things they use for that is they say like whiteness. They'll say that uh, certain studies are are um, or they're from a white perspective. Uh, like an example of that in, from Canada is that they had this. Uh, inquiry into murdered and missing indigenous women or something like that. And they, there was a statistic that uh, from the previous government we had uh, the, uh, from under, under uh, Stephen Harper, which said that 76% uh, of, of, of Aboriginal women who are murdered are murdered by Aboriginal men. And they basically just didn't disprove that statistic. They said that that was not from the perspective, uh, from an indigenous perspective or something like that. And that it was um, institutional racism, and they don't uh, account for their lived experiences, <laughs> and they just like have all of these outs in order to uh, just escape from the the truth in many of these in many of these situations. I know you made a video on on lived experience. I mean that that that's really quite something when you can when they just created this concept that basically says, well, since I feel this way, well then this must be true. Yeah, and it's a sad morphing of the left because the left used to, I mean, in recent decades, they pretended at least, right, that they were the people that really cared about empirical evidence and science and this sort of thing. And, and there was, I think, somewhat more truth to that about 100 years ago or so. Uh, and it's been sort of decaying ever since. And this is just the latest iteration of really, I, and no, again, no one really believes this because if you actually thought, what is the standpoint epistemology? I think is what they call this, that uh, the, you have to be part of the group to understand anything about the group. Well, then, okay, then, like, shut up about white people. You can never talk about <laughs> it again. You're not us. You don't have my lived experience. Don't tell me about what white males do. You're not one. But no one would accept that, and no, and no one believes in this. This is just some weird crap they say that is obviously untrue. Yeah, there's this <laughs> pathetic smoke screen. I mean, I feel, it feels degrading to even have to explain to someone why – anecdotal evidence why their perception of what happened to them personally is not more important than statistical evidence when we're trying to figure out what our society is like. It, it feels patronizing to even have this argument with somebody. Yeah, yeah you do have to have it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's, it's just really incredible that, uh, you know, that can be, that can actually be judged as something that's, um, that's actually legitimate. But what's terrifying about it is that, you know, this is, I, I just, uh, to get a, uh, read a super chat, leftism, leftism is a mental disorder. They, um, uh, they emote, not think. Well, I mean, what's so terrifying about this is that, you know, we can disprove these facts all we want, but at the end of the day, they're still enacting policy based on this. You know, it kind of stops being a joke 
when Goldman Sachs starts creating policy based on intersectionality. You know, it stops being a joke when the Canadian government uses this report, which, which involves things like lived experience, to declare that um, they're, that Canadians, and when they say Canadians, they mean white people, are guilty of genocide. I mean, man, like this is this stuff's, uh, it, it's just so clear that um, really the, the facts don't really that matter, don't really matter, and they'll be shelved when there's a narrative uh, at, at play. And really the direction that narrative is going is one that's that's really frightening. I mean, another another example of that is the, the 1619 project that the New York Times started where um, what, what they're doing is they're trying to rewrite American history and put slavery at the very center of it. And first of all, I mean, they'll say that, well, we have ignored slavery. I mean, slavery is the only thing that people even talk about anymore. The, so the idea that it's been ignored is laughable, but not only that, they're they're cre they're coming up with uh, talking points like that uh, America wasn't a democracy until Black people made it a, a democracy, and that the motivation behind the War of Independence was slavery, and and just all these ridiculous claims, which are just easily debunked by scholars. And to their credit, many scholars have actually come out and said that it's false. But they win a Pulitzer Prize for this thing. I mean, and it's just clear that the only reason this thing is being taken seriously by anyone at all is that it's because it's about black people being victims and it's it's uh, accusing white people of being the villains. Yeah, I mean, they, they just say things. I mean, uh, American history, I, I guess in some sense, it's always been a mythos, but they're trying to make it into a new mythology. It's very strange to see happen in real time. And, and part of it is because, I mean, people say leftism is a mental disorder like uh, the, the fellow did before. And I think you were earlier talking about the fact that liberals it do in fact, especially really liberal people, they're the if you want to find someone who's mentally ill, you know, go to a, an activist. Uh, oh God, like this, and you know, particularly, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think there's a clear mental function that leftist ideology serves with respect to the kinds of mental problems that liberals tend to have because they tend to score very low on measures of self-esteem. And one way, I mean, it's not the most healthy way, perhaps, but one way to help you if you have very low self-esteem is to convince yourself that you're you know, battling the great evil and whatnot. And, and the leftist ideology, unlike right-wing ideology, leftist ideology really focuses on this. And it tells people you have to go individually, go out into the world, be the social justice warrior or whatever, and actually, you know, save people basically and fight evil and all this sort of thing. And you can see why people with a sort of pathologically low degrees of self-esteem would be, would be drawn to that kind of thing. I don't think that's a, a coincidence. Well, in fact, as, as I recall, yeah, I haven't read about this in a long time, but as I recall, there's actually a funny experiment showing where if you <laughs> you give people a political test of their ideology, and they actually become a little more leftist if right before you do this, you have them dwell on all the worst things about themselves, suggesting there's a direct <laughs> causal connection between low self-esteem and this kind of political ideology. Yeah, well, one line I, I really, uh, from the distributist, I really liked was what he said was that more people are leaving university today with mental disorders than education. <laughs> um, but, you know, another thing that I thought was really, uh, that I really enjoyed about um, the work that you and Ryan have done is that uh, I, not only about the narratives today, but also going back in the history and disproving a lot of them. So not only that, you know, white people are horrible today, but that they ever really were like that. You know, one thing that I remember when I was uh, maybe, you know, when I was 16, 17, and I really started taking an interest in history. Of course, I'd been, you know, fed all this, uh, all of these lies my entire life. Uh, basically, I, I, I was taught that before 1965 or, be, you know, before Martin Luther King taught white people to uh, be virtuous, they were essentially like these genocidal maniacs who would kill black people for fun or something like that. But um, I mean, one thing that one one thing that really crossed my mind is weird is like, you know, I look back at all these historical pictures and, you know, you see pictures of black guys in the 20s with suits, cars, uh, houses. And I, I thought, well, I mean, gee, for a society that supposedly hated them so badly and like oppressed them to such an extent, I mean, they weren't too bad. They weren't too bad off. I mean, most of the world didn't even have electricity at that at that time. I mean, it's clearly it's clear that not only is the narrative false today, but the idea that this ever has been true is uh, is questionable, really. Yeah, I mean, we can basically go Thomas Sowell on this and you know point out that prior to all these welfare reforms, the fact is the wealth gap between blacks and whites in this country was smaller. The uh, 
you know, the black people still had families and things like this. That's true. They didn't have college degrees, but you're, I mean, if college degrees don't help you advance in terms of wealth, then, I mean, they're not, they're also not giving you some, you know, great humanities education or something like this. I mean, there's no purpose for them outside of that. So in a lot of ways, you, you, you could say that the situ- it's not clear that the situation now is better for black people in America than it was prior to all of this. I mean, and also, I mean, telling people, this ideology does not help people. Telling people that uh, the reason why they haven't got ahead of life, ahead in life, is because of uh, these evil white people, and, and so you got to fight them. Uh, th- this, I mean, it makes people. And there are studies showing this: instilling a victim mentality in someone makes them a into assholes, uh, and, and b it doesn't feel good. It's bad for your mental health uh, to think this way, and, and that hasn't helped them either. And it, I mean, it also implicitly encourages. The left does this. They encourage black people to be obsessed with comparing their relative standing to white people. And and this cannot be healthy at the group level either, especially for black people, as opposed to just being improve, you know, obsessed with improving themselves relative to where they were in the past. They're constantly comparing themselves with us. Uh, that, that That's a sort of basic premise behind uh, the entire I don't know, enterprise of the left wing take on race and, and a lot of other takes in left wing ideology for that matter. And, and that's not good for people. I mean, no one thinks back. Yeah, I don't know. They, they, they act as if the world was just this horrible place to exist in in the 1950s or something like that. And no one, I don't think anyone really thinks that. Yeah, you know, the one thing that was that was in, incredible that was that in the in the lived experience video you made, it showed that uh, blacks who literally lived under segregation had uh, claimed that they um, were less likely to claim that they were the victims of so-called racism than ones who were born like in the 1990s. I mean, it's just insane. I mean, it, like uh, the idea that, you know, they're act- that <laughs> the, the, the idea that, you know, that, that America today is somehow like just deeply anti-black and uh, even according to their own narrative that back then it was supposedly way worse. I mean, <laughs> you know, just telling some, some, you know, exposing someone to social justice politics it implants those ideas into their mind. And like you pointed out, it's not really, it doesn't really benefit them. I mean, I don't want to make the, uh, I, I don't want anyone to get the impression that I, 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 just, I want black people to suffer. I mean, I don't, but A, I want these lies to stop. I really want, I, I don't want them to blame their problems on whites. And secondly, uh, you know, it's not really designed to help them. I'm, I'm convinced it's really something that's uh, designed to help the people in power. It's designed to advance an agenda really. and. They're, and you know they're kind of just the uh, the they're, they're just kind of the, the minions that, that are being used in order to advance that agenda because really it, it, what it just boils it down to is just uh, them blaming their problems on whites. I mean there's a great uh, uh, article in um, there's there was a few great articles that American Renaissance wrote. One of them was about this uh, white te- uh, teacher who taught at a major- at a majority black school. I, and when I said majority, he said it was like over ninety percent. But, um, you know, he, he, he just he discussed things like how, you know, they, they've been taught to have to, to view everything like through the lens of their own blackness and that, you know, and everything is designed to really just uh, inculcate this sense of victimhood in them. And, and the other one that was really interesting was how uh, an American Renaissance uh, article on uh, affirmative action in a fire department and really how this guy who worked for the, for there for 30 years, he basically said, it just d- destroyed the competency of the entire fire department. And, you know, when you talk of something like, like uh, when you talk of something like the fire department, that's something that you can't, re- that, you know, society can't really afford to have a, uh, a bad fire department. And it just seems like that's kind of pu- that, that like the, the narrative and the agenda is really just being put above competency in basically all these situations. Oh, well, of course. I mean, the fact that the majority of large corporations in the United States have a policy of trying to hire people on the basis of them not being white males is obviously not good for the efficiency of our uh, top companies, however important you know you, you think that sort of thing is. And unfortunately, I mean, we, we black people, like most people by nature, are fairly tribal. But then we socialize them to be, in many cases, just like incredibly racist. Like I remember a few months ago, I think maybe a little longer, there was that Vice story about black people that were taking vacations from white, like. The point of the vacation was just to go somewhere where there were no white people. It's just bizarrely racist thing to, to do that, that you don't, I mean, 
if you hang out with white people that are what most people would consider racist, like they, they don't talk about going on vacations <laughs> where, well, I, I maybe someone would, but but it's the, the point is just that they they encourage to be quite racist and obsessed with race. Like you said, everything is viewed through this prism, such that any time a white person is mean to them, it has to be because of racism. It couldn't just be that. Well, a it couldn't just be that they deserved. To, you know that they were being an asshole, but also it couldn't be that the the white person was being an asshole. For some reason, everything has to be interpreted through this lens. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I will say that you know, white flight is certainly a thing, and I do. It is. It's understandable that you know someone would want to uh, associate with people like them and live in a community with people like them. But of course, that's considered racist when it's white people that do it. I mean, you know, I, I always thought like, is it race? Is it uh, discriminatory to choose uh, to marry one person and not to marry another person? If not, then why is it discriminatory to say that you want to live in this uh, community with these people and not uh, in this other community? But but I mean, that, uh, other than that, like, um, what what I, what I wanted to say was that in terms of um, yeah, in in terms of the, like the, the idea that everything is kind of interpreted through this lens of of race, like you know, it, it is really just feeding into that agenda that we had mentioned. And I, I, I wanted, I have to think like there was a way out of it. So what would you say the way out of kind of the situation that this kind of uh, society based on lies, uh, what would you say that the way out of it really is? I mean, like you've worked on uh, human biodiversity and uh, race realism as it's, as it's known. Uh, would you say that that's actually a very useful, that's a very useful tool in order to debunk many of these, uh, many of these falsehoods? I mean, it, it can be if the person is sufficiently open-minded. Uh, if they're willing to listen, of course. Yeah. I, I mean, fundamentally, how do we get out of this? I mean, I don't know. I th I'm pretty pessimistic, I think. I don't think we're going to get out of this. I think this is going to end horribly. But uh, And I've become more pessimistic of time. You know, on the human diverse, uh, biodiversity front, 10 years ago, I thought that once it was true that we had, you know, we could just give people genetic tests when they're tiny kids. It can predict their future level of educational attainment better than could a questionnaire about their parents' socioeconomic status. And the thousands of genes that go into these genetic scores differ systematically by race in a way that correlates almost perfectly with racial differences and national differences in mean IQ score. I would have thought once we have evidence like that, surely... Uh, you know, this would be a news story. People will hear about it. People will care. And this will have some effect. But in fact, I mean, that has come. It's gone. No one cared. And so, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not very optimistic. Well, what I was going to say was that I think that it's not only enough to really have the facts. You need, we need to have kind of an inst institutional strength behind, uh, behind right wing ideas that will function in a similar way that, uh, that the left kind of has this machine in order to create situations like the Ahmad Arbery uh, um, outrage. Yeah, there I mean, needs to be kind of like this, these, this institutional strength behind right wing ideas. And I, I really think that's kind of the only way that something uh, that, that, you know, some of these uh, lies are going to be are going to be crushed, but also that, you know, um, more, more healthy ideas and more uh, factual ideas that, you know, function better for society are actually going to come about. Yeah. It's going to be through having uh, some kind of reputable institutions with uh, money behind them that are are willing to promote right wing ideas. Well, I mean, that's that's definitely true. In the long run, uh, power is concentrated in institutions and among elites. And if you actually want to change anything, you have to uh, either create competitive institutions or subvert ones that already exist. Uh, but that's hard. I mean, I don't. I mean, that, that is how we would solve this if we were going to. But I don't think we're going to do that because it's hard and it's not the fun thing to do. And yeah, <laughs> like, so I'm very pessimistic. This is just. I mean, I don't know. This is just speculation. But because uh, it, it's hard, right? Not only do you have left-wing institutions, you have these right-wing institutions, so-called, which when people feel a kind of right-wing energy in them, they end up uh, being fans of, of Ben Shapiro. <laughs> And so they've subverted the natural, uh, you know, flow from the sort of right wing temperament. To, there are no real right wing institutions to match those because they've created fake ones. I, I mean, it's possible that you know real ones are created by people. It's it, you know, it'd be a long thing. It take a long time. It'd be hard. It'd have to have you'd have to have very competent people behind it. It's and money. And then where are we gonna get that money? Who knows? Uh, but it's possible that would happen. And then they'd out compete the fake right wing. And then we'd have a more a legitimate set of institutions in the United States uh, combating based on real ideological differences. Is that that is the the best solution, but I'm not optimistic it'll actually be done. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I, I would be more uh, optimistic in, in, in that. You know, I, I do look towards you know groups like American Renaissance and publications like Countercurrents as, as a good, as a good start. But yeah, eventually, it does need money behind it. I mean, what would you say that that if there'd be like one kind of uh, institu- uh, one kind of institution or one kind of outlet to actually promote uh, your ideas around things like HBD? I mean, what what would you say you you would really uh, like to have in regards to that, if it was well, possible? Well, I, I I mean, if it was, if it was feasible. I mean, fundamentally, I I think we have a good map of what institutions should be like already from our, our, our friends in the mainstream. Uh, you would need sort of centers of intellectual production. They probably couldn't take the university, so it'd have to be some kind of think tank, uh, both for the, the kind of thing that, that I tend to focus on and also other more less, you know, science more conceptual, more political philosophy type things as well. Uh, and, and then you'd have to have something like a journalism type institution to uh, spread that to the masses. It'd be really nice if for some reason we could also make it so that all the smart people had to go sit in our think tanks for four years and just hear our ideologies like they have at the universities. That'd be a really great setup. <laughs> I don't see how we're going to get that done. Uh, so yeah, it kind of mirror what already uh, exists, I guess. Only it would be uh, people with different ideas. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't think that we can have it on as big of a scale as the left, because the left essentially has infinite money that they can print. But I do think that fundamentally, uh, right wing ideas are more in line with human nature, and that eventually that's going to come home to roost. I mean. You look at cities like Detroit and, uh, you know, this is the result. Uh, that's the end result of that ideology. That's the end result of all the lies is just dysfunction. And, you know, I mean, my hope is that there's going to be enough uh, competent people and uh, people who care enough and people with money eventually that actually uh, begin to take right wing ideas seriously and, and eventually uh, work towards creating some kind of institutions behind them. I, you know, that's what I kind of see as uh, as the way out of this. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I certainly don't have the money. I certainly don't have the experience to do it, but I have to think like, you know, there's, uh, there's so many, there's so many people in the West that have so much to lose and just people with, with money and with influence today that, you know, this, this ideology, it's designed to destroy them. And, and, you know, I, I hope that they can, they can kind of take that, uh, they're willing to actually, uh, put that money towards good use and to kind of like tr- try to find a way out of it. Um, so someone uh, had talked about a right wing publication or, or something like that, like even just starting with like some kind of right wing academic paper. Of course, it wouldn't be taken seriously by the academy right away. But even just having that with like this big this big information dump, which we could write papers for, I think that would just be so useful. I mean, potentially it. it yeah, I mean, anything it could be. There are places obviously where you can find right wing writing now, but they're not. I don't know, they just don't have as, uh, enough sort of momentum behind them to have an effect. A- and there does have to be, they kind of have to be two sets of institutions, one which produces ideas by these weird intellectual types, and then another which sort of turns those ideas into uh, ma- con- things that are consumable by the masses, what the journalists do for uh, contemporary academics and the like. Um, you talk about Detroit. I mean, the thing is, I- I'd be more optimistic in a way if we were becoming Detroit, because that's just so horrendous. But you know, Detroit, I mean, we're filling our country with, with Hispanics and increasingly Asians, not, we're not going to become South Africa or Detroit. Or, well, I can't speak for Canada, I guess, but for the United States anyway. Um, I assume Canada is not filling. It's Canada. mostly with a- a- Asians and Muslims, mostly. Yeah, right. Well, Muslims, that is a more uh, potentially problematic. But, but, but in any case, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to become like Detroit enough to, to force people to feel like they have to. And people are very concerned about sort of the end you know, you can escape things individually without doing it as a society. And and you, you talk about, you know, right wing ideas are in line of human nature, but it's amazing how malleable some of our ideas are. I mean, I remember there was a survey a year ago in the United States. I think it was 48 percent now of parents in the United States say they would be fine if their kid was transgender. Oh, that's I, 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 10 years ago. I wouldn't have thought that was possible. <laughs> I, I do. I do wonder if how, how true that actually is, though, because. I mean, I, I, I just feel like that's another one of those issues that everyone's against it. No one is comfortable with this transgenderism stuff, but they know that there's just all that entire uh, complex behind the ideas that will punish you if you say anything against them. 
I, I, I just feel like that's one that like people aren't going to go that aren't going to go for. P parents don't want their kids to be transgender. I, I, I mean, at least I can't. I just find it hard to believe that there'd be that many that would be okay with that. I, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you, but the you know the, the issue is that if the left is screaming their ideology and then everyone who disagrees with them sort of sits down and shuts up, well, then they win. So even if it's true that the reason why these people are saying this is because uh, they, they don't want to say their real views and they're kind of being cowardly or whatever, if they can get that percentage high enough, I mean, look with the race thing, right? Like, I mean, the fact is, I'm pretty sure there are way more than the statistics would indicate white people who don't uh, who don't feel totally comfortable with something like their daughter, you know, marrying a black person or something like this. And yet, in statistics, even, I mean, it wasn't until the 90s that the majority of white Americans even started saying to surveys that they were okay with that. Uh but the, the, but they don't have to really be okay with it as long as they shut up about it, right? <laughs> then uh, they yeah. try to win. Yeah, I think that um, one thing you had mentioned is you need you need to kind of get the uh, right wing ideas into a digestible way for things like media and alternative media. And I think that um, it kind of goes back to uh, what I'd said earlier about narrative and that uh, people believe narratives more than they do uh, facts and statistics. So something like HBD. I mean, that, that's something that's, uh, it's of course, fact, fact based. It's a uh, scientific way to um, discuss things like uh, disparity in, uh, in terms of race. But I think that in terms of a narrative, there needs to be like a, a separate right wing narrative in, to, in order to um, in order to kind of motivate people to uh, take action instead of just, you know, sitting down and accepting uh, what's going on. You know, what, what Devin Stack had said to me, and I actually agree with this quite a bit, is that in order for uh, in order for our side to win, right wing ideas need to take on kind of a religiosity in the same way that left wing ideas do, and that you know um, I don't think that there really ever has been a time where everything has been based on truth, um, where you know uh, and people just looked at the facts. I think that it's always kind of been colored by the uh, by, by by the elites, but also the kind of uh, the um, the narrative of the day. And uh, of course, there's always been a ruling class, and there's always been people in power who uh, will, you know, orient facts in a way that benefits them. But I, I'm of the opinion that that's something that always that, that's always existed, and is not necessarily a bad thing. And that um, the 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 answer is that you really just need a narrative and a uh, an elite and uh, institutions around them. You know, even though if they are based on narrative. Is a, that what they, the society they create is a healthy one, and I guess that's the direction that I kind of want to go with right wing ideas. It's to um, uh, you know really f uh, form like a counter narrative around them, and you know I, I feel I, I do feel like in my in at least in my personal life uh, it does seem to be shifting. It does seem to be shifting in a positive direction. I mean, one of the most white pilling things is comment sections. You can just go on any comment section for any mainstream media article, and they're just getting ripped to shreds. Uh, there, you know, all these like real obnoxious uh, anti-white videos are getting downvoted. So it does seem like there is a demand for that. Um, and I'd say to really get traction behind that, you kind of need you kind of need a narrative and almost a religiosity behind right wing ideas. I, I know you're not a religious guy, but what would you say about religion in terms of actually or some or some kind of substitute for religion, like nationalism or whatever, for as a way to kind of rally support for uh, for ideas? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, if you want to increase the uh, competitive advantage that an ideology has, certain aspects of religion or things that tend to go over religion can be very beneficial, whether the left has or the right does not. Um, for one thing, I think probably you have to tell people that what they're fighting isn't people that are going to, uh, I mean, you can say this, but this can't be the main point, that they're going to, you know, minorly decrease the efficiency of our economy. We're going to grow at 2% instead of 2.5%. Um, now, in the long run, that is, in fact, I think, uh, quite important, but it's hard to get people sort of uh, excited about that. It has to be a moral thing. They have to be fighting evil for some reason. Uh, and moreover, it has to be an evil that I think that they can actually do something about. The, the left has a – most people are kind of uh, – politically, they'll just go with whatever. And then there's the small fraction of people that, that want to try to enforce political norms. The left has a thing where they say, uh, look, guys, racism, sexism, these things are, are very bad, and they're in your personal life, and you need to call them out when you see them. You can go to the local activist group. We're going to go, I don't know, do pro whatever these leftist activist groups do that they do. Uh, they get people – because it's not very inspiring to say there's evil uh, taking over our society, like with the abortion thing. There's evil 
because conservatives frame that as evil. Some of them do. But also, you can't do anything individually about it. Right. That's not, I don't think, a very good motivating force if you want sort of right wing justice warriors, the analogy to yeah. social justice warriors. I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's rude. But what you want, if you want people to sort of adopt your ideology in a grassroots way, you want these psychos running around harassing people to say, how could you possibly say that? That's that's anti white. You can't like what you so you hate white people. You have to have people sort of in people's face being rude. Uh, and to do that, you have to make them feel like they're these agents fighting evil. But but also at the same time, there's a problem with the far right wing. They can't they they can't be. That's a nice way to put it. They can't be. They can't seem like Nazis. I'll put it that way. They can't seem like Nazis. And if they yeah, do, that's, that's gonna go really bad. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, fundamentally, the use of power is to either a get someone to do what you want them to, or to prevent them from doing something you don't want them to. And you know, the left has like all these you know organs of influence in order to do that: media, uh, education, and these activists running around. I, I I do feel like you know the the right wing needs to learn to be intolerant. You know, you have to be in absolutely intolerant of anything that you don't want. You know, uh, so I think that. Um, you would eventually need like some way to actually punish uh, people who perpetuate things like white privilege theory or critical race theory or, or things like that. Um, and, and, you know, I think the best way to do that is with like a right wing uh, pro white ADL kind of organization. Uh, you know, I, I, I and yeah, I acknowledge that, you know, right wing ideas would need to be enforced. But, um, you know, I, I stand by the fact that I think that, you know, under a uh, uh, un under a more uh, hierarchical, more natural uh, society, you wouldn't need to enforce them as much because it, it takes a lot more. Uh, it takes a lot more force to convince someone that gender doesn't exist than it does to just convince someone that it does exist. You know, it takes a lot more. Uh, it takes a lot more um, force to convince someone that you know a group that commits that makes up thirteen percent of the com the population and commits over fifty percent of the crime. It takes a lot more. It takes a lot more energy to convince people that well, that's actually because of this like kind of unfalsifiable white white privilege in the air than it is to just say you know that's kind of just the result of nature. So I, I mean, I, I'd say like the kind of advantage that right wing ideas would have is that uh, they, I just think I just think they're more in line and more more in line with the truth. I mean, I acknowledge that you know we base our stuff on narratives too. I mean, not maybe you could if you dissected everything there are, are there falsehoods yeah there probably are but i think overall i think it just seems more in line with uh more in line with human nature i'd, I'd say and I, I don't know i mean my hope is that uh we can we can get that uh institutional strength that we need we're not going to be able to outdo the left but you know i just hope that we have more competency and more truth on our side i, I, I kind of see that as the uh and i mean that, that's what i'm holding out hope for as kind of a way out of it yeah i mean if we get out of it i guess that'll That'll be how, right? Is these people doing uh, surprisingly competent things? That uh, I mean, one thing to say is that the history of the far right in America—I don't know about the history of the far right in Canada, but in America anyway—it does not work. inspire confidence. It does not make you think that we're going to have highly competent people that will create good institutions that will allow us to combat things. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I just I, the reason I thought that is just because like the left, uh, you know, they're they're like making a point to make like uh, use affirmative action to make like, you know, some transgendered black uh, woman Muslim into like the CEO of their company or something like that. I mean, eventually, eventually, you know, that, that comes back to bite you. So. I got a super chat. Uh, most people want social validation that explains how they choose their opinions of and what to s they say. They seem to be deep evolutionary instincts. So yeah, so um, people tend to be uh, t tend to want social validation. You know, I I've always thought that's kind of the the motivation behind liberalism. Like you know, I find a lot of these white liberals they don't really believe what they say. They just they've kind of been given this the idea that it's the moral position to hold. So like none of them actually like want to quote unquote challenge their own white privilege. None of them would ever want to give up the positive things they have in life. It's kind of just seems like some kind of uh, way for them to feel like a, a good person. You know, they want to feel like they're Martin Luther King and they kind of want that dopamine hit. But I really think a lot of them aren't serious about it though. I think that's that's right. And that's, that's as much as far to the right as it is the left because why is it that someone thinks that if they take a left wing view on something, then they will be seen as as good by the leftists. But they also know that 
they're not going to be seen evil by the other half of society as evil by the other half of society, right? The right is not going to treat them the way the left would should they take a right wing view on something. And so you created, I mean, why would most people take right wing views and especially defend them in a serious way when all of the social pressure is exerted in one direction? And, and if they're not with the right, the right will say, oh, well, I think you're mistaken. How sad, how unfortunate, how unfortunate. Let me show you this, this Prager U video with a chart or something. Whereas no. the left is, is going to call them evil, call them racist, try to get them fired, all sorts of crazy crap, right? Uh, and, and block their development as a person. The, the incentive structure is just horrible that has been set up for people. Yeah, I, I guess like the message I, I want to get through to what well, I usually would like to say to, to white liberals is like, what are they personally going to willing to give up? I mean, you you say you have white privilege. Um, what percentage of your salary are you going to give up? 25, 50? I mean, what percentage of your uh, ki your kid's future salary do they have to give up? Do they have to give up their spot in, in school? Do they need to uh, be held back. Do they need to like not have the opportunities in the future? I try to like put it, I try to like put it to them. So like, what are they personally willing to give up for that? And I, I don't know. I guess my point is I, I'm hope I, I, I'd say I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm hopeful that there actually will be, that, you know, change actually will be possible in that in the right direction. <laughs> Maybe you're a bit more black pilled than me on that, though. I mean, I mean, even if you are black pilled, I mean, you might as well, you know, try a bit anyway. It can't hurt if you even, you know, because obviously, even though I am quite pessimistic, I still make content and things like this because there's no, I mean, you might as well, even if you think that you, it's not certain, but there's a high probability that things aren't going to turn out great. I mean, even if they don't, you know, th there's no honor in being a cuck. There's no honor in being that, you know, that bearded uh, millennial male with the thick glasses who, um, you know, uh, has the, ha has like some comic book t-shirt on and, you know, it says, well, white people, you know, you need to acknowledge your privilege or something like that. I mean, like just, oh my God. <laughs> if, I, if I had to go down fighting, I mean, it's not going to be like that. <laughs> so, I mean. Yeah, no, like, that's disgraceful. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but 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 yeah, I guess um, I, I I guess I am more uh, I I am more hopeful in that in that, you know may, maybe in terms of um, will America you know survive as a country will uh, it, it, America still be something in the future who knows but I you know I guess I am I'm holding out hope on on Europeans really uh, you know Canada my country it's like I don't no I don't really identify with the country as it exists today but in terms of like. Um, in, in, in terms of European civilization, I am hopeful for the future. I, I basically want to build my, my goal is really to build something new uh, because, you know, I, I don't like to hold on to uh, I hold on to like rotten institutions and rotten uh, symbology, which has really just been co-opted. So I guess I guess I, I guess I, I like to be forward looking in, in this kind of thing. But anyway, I think uh, that's probably a good place to end it. We've been going on for about an uh, hour and 20 minutes. So is there anything you'd uh, last you'd like to say, uh, Sean, before we finish? Uh, no, don't think so. It's been a good chat. Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, so is there any content you're, uh, you're working on that anyone should uh, look forward to in the near future? Oh, um, the, yeah, the, the, I guess there's a bunch of stuff that I'm, uh, mostly done with. I always have more stuff I can release on sort of racial differences and what causes them. Um, I'm active on, I'm more active on Twitter recently than I have been in the past. And I post studies about various things on there fairly regularly. So I don't know what I'll post, but I'm sure I'll post something on there soon. So yeah, you know, I, guess, I guess those are the sorts of things. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming on and uh, I will speak to you all later. Good night. <laughs>